The Gospel reading is John chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. This weekend we have been marking the anniversary of the moment when the horrors of European war finally stopped and an era of new peace began. We try to imagine those who were young adults then, with their mixed feelings of revulsion and grief and probably guilt, and yet of relief and hope and determination. The children of that generation which means my generation, who now try to live the world's life, can look back and see the flourishing of goodness that was promised at that moment and which was delivered by those who had had to live through that time. So we look at the organisations of the United Nations, the kind of new non-political internationalism that allows us to see and understand and feel compassion for the whole world in a way that the communications of those days just did not allow. We look at the transformation of the nuclear and radar technologies of war fighting into resources of energy and advances of human communications for our age. And we look at the individuals who were remade by their experiences then. People like my father, Morris, with his lifelong revulsion of violence, his patience with the failings of other people of all ages, his very gentle handling of the world where once he had been sent to fight and kill, the way he left those medals in a drawer left them for me to resurrect as a monument to his transforming suffering and to its influence on generations in our family. You do not have to attempt some kind of impossible feat, some kind of vindicating of the catastrophe of that war to see many, many resurrections from a time of death and destruction. Meanwhile, we live as a whole world community through a crisis that is one of the largest to have afflicted us since 1945, though surely tiny by comparison with that one. And though we do not know how far through our period of lockdown we now are in this country, we see other societies beginning to emerge from theirs. And we're asking each other, 
what life is going to be like afterwards. What are the things that we will recover which we lost? Lunches with friends. What are the things we have discovered in this time and we're determined to keep them? Video calls with family members. And what are the things that we have lost and cannot regain and will mourn? Thousands of livelihoods and, of course, for many, the chance to say that final goodbye to someone they loved, someone they could never have believed they wouldn't be able to speak to in those moments. But I think we will see signs of a resurrection. When enough time has passed to give us that hindsight wisdom, I think we will see a pandemic of neighbourly kindness, of choosing to spend time loving people, of acknowledging and appreciating the key workers who sustain the fabric of our normality. And I think we'll see the environment demonstrating to us vividly how we can yet save it, how we can keep letting the planet breathe as it has begun to breathe in places for the first time in ages over recent weeks, from the skies over Chinese cities to the waters in Venetian canals, how much of the earth and its oxygen the human species ought to be occupying to give the rest of creation its fair share. And though again it takes a colossal act of imagination to accept the genocidal raging of this virus by looking at it from a point of view way beyond human interests, it is certainly possible to see a million resurrections and transformations to come as a result of it. Jesus said, you know the way I am taking, and he made clear he meant to take us to himself by that way too. But we don't absorb what that really says most of the time for the very simple reason that we use that verse almost exclusively in funeral services. And in a funeral service, especially for someone whose death has caused us deep distress because we loved them, we want that line just to mean something about the soul of our loved one crossing from the life where we knew them to a tranquil, safe, secure place where they are held as lovingly in God's arms as they were held in the arms of those who loved them here. In that moment of grief, in that moment of goodbye, we just want that way to be simple and direct, instant and pleasant for them. But when we read that line at any other moment, apply it to ourselves and to the faith that we have not finished living out in this life, we know perfectly well what way Jesus Christ was going, and that is the way he is inviting us to go with him. And it's the way that goes by the way of Gethsemane and Golgotha, of a tomb and of a garden. Our faith is a way that takes us right to the verge of collapse, of destruction, of our known life being killed. And when we're teetering on the edge of that, we are not pulled back as if we are being rescued in the last scene of an adventure movie. No, we're pushed the next step forward. We're pushed right into it. We're pushed right through it. And it might be a world war. It might be a virus circling the earth like a pestilence. It might be your complete humiliation as you are found out in some way and cast out and serve your right. It might be your collapse, financial, professional, medical, social, and not your fault at all. It might be the illness that creates a new you out of you. 
and forces you to start all over again from the seated position, or using just four of your senses, or measuring your remaining life in months, not years. Your faithfulness will be to find the resurrection in that and not allow anyone to take it away from you when you know you went with Christ on the way you know he takes. And if all that sounds like the content of a rather cheesy autobiography of some bad guy made good and we've all read those or of some saccharine saintly cripple and we've read one or two of those, you may suffer from the problem so many people have in the Western world. You may not have faced such crucifixion in your life. You may have had a stable, placid life with everything you ever needed and love in the right places and money enough and a career path that worked and a routine that is comfortable and a faith that is never frightening. So am I condemning you? No. Instead, I offer you three possibilities. One is that crucifixions may come in different shapes and sizes and you will find the dangerous turns you've taken and the encounters that bruised as you look back. Don't underestimate yourself. A second is that you may yet have to take that way and perhaps you know what that means and you need to make a start on it. And I don't mean inventing some romantic self-martyrdom as so many self-obsessed people do to make themselves look amazing and admirable and holy. No, I mean the kind of death you know you have to face. The defining pattern that has to stop, perhaps your relationship with alcohol or violence in the home or power over someone who loves you. And it will break you to stop, but you must. Or the article of religious faith that you have been turning somersaults for years trying to adhere to but deep down, you just know it's not describing the God you believe in and it needs to go. And never mind what anyone else, including the minister, might think of you. Or the act of love you need to risk. Knowing there's better than a 50-50 chance that it will break your heart, but you have no choice. You know you have no choice. The third possibility for those who have not walked Christ's way through crucifixion to resurrection is that your job is to accompany someone who is going on that way. To go as far as you can with them until you can go no further so that they are not alone and you wait for them afterwards and they know you will, and you'll be there again for them when things have changed and perhaps other people will not understand and will not like them anymore. The Easter promise is not just that Christ's resurrection is an inspiration for us, a blessing to us. Rather, I think, Easter is our own experience, or at least it can be. It can be a resurrection to a kind of walking that feels different because an old burden is no longer being carried awkwardly the way it used to be. It can be a resurrection to a form of faith that at last makes sense and convinces us because it's no longer what we think other people think we ought to think. It can be a resurrection to a heart unshackled by past ligatures and able to be offered in love again. And it can be a resurrection to a view that is no longer cluttered up with people who for one reason or another 
were wanting to crucify us. It is, I think, the reason why the places where humans suffer most are often the places where the most resolute and teeth-gritted faith is to be found around the world. And it is conversely the reason why those with comfortable lives in communities like ours don't long to walk in this way, don't long to take their place in the community of faith at all, and that makes us sad. You know it is the way, because you know it is the truth. And inside of you, somewhere, you kind of know it is the life. Thanks be to God.